Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's live streaming Chautauqua presentation of the annual Ron Messerich Distinguished Lecture in Philosophy and Religious Studies, sponsored by Eastern Kentucky University's nationally prominent honors program and housed in the College of Letters, Arts, and Social Sciences. My name is Eric Liddell, Chautauqua Lecture Series Coordinator, and I'm delighted to be joined tonight by our presenter, Dr. Jennifer Frey of the University of South Carolina, as well as by my colleague, Dr. Mike Austin of the EKU Philosophy and Religious Studies Program for this, the finale of our 2020-21 Virtual Chautauqua Lecture Series. Hello to you both. It's a pleasure to have you here at EKU Chautauqua. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. In just a moment, I will hand the screen over to Mike to say a few words about the Messerich Lecture and to introduce Dr. Frey, and then we'll both drop off screen and return at the conclusion of her remarks for the Q&A and discussion. And viewers out there, I see many of you saying hi and chiming in. Welcome Jacob and Matt and Tom and Jose and others. You are encouraged to submit comments and questions right there in the YouTube chat or you can also do so via Twitter at EKU Chautauqua. I will be checking that feed as well. Full details of all of our EKU Chautauqua events are on our website, and you can follow us on Facebook and Twitter for updates and reminders. And so without further ado, let me just turn things over to Mike. Thanks, Eric, appreciate it. So yes, Dr. Jennifer Frey, she's an associate professor of philosophy at the University of South Carolina. I received her PhD from the University of Pittsburgh. And her work focuses mainly on um, the intersection of issues in philosophy of action, ethics, and metaethics, and does work in history of ethics. Uh, more relevant in some ways to tonight, she does a lot of work, both writing and speaking in public philosophy. So basically doing philosophy for non-academic audiences, kind of like in the grand tradition of Socrates and others who engaged, you know, normal people, not just academics. Um, her podcast, a philosophy and literature podcast that she hosts is called Sacred and Profane Love. So if you're interested in that, check it out. And as uh, Dr. Liddell said, her talk this year is our annual Ron Messerich Lecture in uh, Philosophy and Religious Studies. Ron is a recently retired colleague, a longstanding member of the Philosophy and Religion Department and was chair at one time. He hired me, so I'll always appreciate that. And um, now that he's retired, he's got more time not just for reading philosophy, but to indulge in his love of baseball, but I'm sure he's out there tonight. So this is in that tradition of, of Ron's teaching and writing and research of bringing philosophy to bear on issues that really are at the center of our lives as human beings. So Dr. Frey's talk tonight is in that spirit. It's entitled, What is the Purpose of Life? Classical and Contemporary Answers. So welcome, Dr. Frey. Yeah, thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks to Eric and to Mike for inviting me. Um, I feel really honored and happy to be giving this lecture. So yeah, so the title of my talk is What is the Purpose of Life? Classical and Contemporary Perspectives. And <clears throat> I just wanna start by <laughs> reflecting on how I'm gonna approach this topic. So when we hear the question, what is the purpose of life? Uh, we can hear it in a couple of ways. We can hear it as a question about the meaning of life. And I think the meaning of life question is a legitimate, important question, but it's not the question that I'm going to address in my lecture this evening. I'm going to hear the question in a different register. Namely, I'm gonna hear the question about what the purpose of life is as the question about the goal of life, right? If life has no goal, then there is no objective measure of whether life has been successful or whether it's failed, right? If there's no target, then there's no missing the target. Um, but I think the question itself obviously implies that there is a goal. And of course, I will argue that there is a goal to human life. Um, I also do not intend to hear my question in a merely theoretical way. You know, I'm, I'm a philosopher and, and so I do theory, but the question itself is practical. Uh, in fact, I'm gonna argue that it's tied to our deepest longing as human beings. That is to say our longing to be happy uh, in the sense of being deeply fulfilled as the kind of thing that we are. 
And so the question about the purpose of life is a question that orients our practical deliberation and guides our choices. So when I ask myself what the goal or purpose of human life is, I'm really asking myself an existential practical question, one that touches on how I'm to live and what sort of person I am to become and to what sort of life I should aspire. And that means that I am really asking a question about the good, right, about the good life or about human excellence or human flourishing. Now, I think lots of people today would deny that your life has any goal beyond what you yourself would fix for it. So they might deny that it has a single goal. Um, maybe they just think you have lots of goals, uh, but whatever your goals are, it's just whatever you think they are. And so people will say things like, well, you know, whatever it is, you should just live your truth or you should live your best life or you should live as your true self. And whatever that amounts to is entirely up to you so long as you don't hurt other people. Right, so it's really a life of self-expression or authenticity or something like this. And um, as common as this is, I, th I think it's kind of a recipe uh, for bad outcomes, right? It's a recipe for anxiety, it's a recipe for unhappiness, it's a recipe for lack of fulfillment. Because all it says to people, to young people in particular, is that they should just live for themselves, right? They, they should come up with a self or they should figure out themselves and then they should live for themselves. Um, but the thing is, the purpose of your life is not to live for yourself. Um, that is, in fact, a recipe for misery. And I believe this has been fairly well documented. Uh, it's been well documented in art and literature and film. Uh, it's been argued, you know, by philosophers, but it's also been well documented in empirical studies, like people who uh, live in, in very self-consciously selfish ways um, don't don't end up being people who are very happy or satisfied with their lives. Somehow this doesn't stop us from putting out this message as the, as the recipe for a good life, but, but I don't think it's very successful. Um, now, one characteristic form that living for yourself takes these days, of course, is living a life of pleasure, right? And also, if you happen to study economics or some of the other social sciences, you will find many people who are committed hedonists Right, so hedonists are those persons who argue that um, goodness can be cashed out in terms of pleasure, right? And badness can be cashed out in terms of pain. Um, and so on this view, a good life um, is just gonna be a life that has an overall balance of pleasurable states over pain states. Um, and I think in, in the lucky case or the happy case, a good life will also be a just or moral life. Uh, but the two kinds of goodness don't really have anything essentially to do with one another. Um, and I think, uh, you know, we sort of have to concede this because everybody knows that there are people who take pleasure in bad things like dominating others and take pleasures in other forms of vice. Um, but I, I guess I just want to note that in my experience, at least, hedonism is really more of a theory than a practice. So I know a lot of theoretical hedonists, but I've really never met any practical hedonists. Um, and I think this is fairly uh, illustrative or instructive. Um, it's just sort of like something you notice if you've been alive long enough that people do in fact aspire to more than pleasure in their lives, um, that people make great sacrifices and suffer tremendously for the things that they really love and value even when the pleasure pain calculus doesn't come out in the correct hedonist way, and even when they have no expectation that it will, and even theoretical hedonists that I know act in this very way. So in this talk, I'm gonna outline, and I'm gonna ultimately reject uh, contemporary views about the point or purpose of human life and of what will make us happy. And I'm also basically gonna reject contemporary language of happiness altogether uh, as misleading. Um, and I want to try to show that the classical answer to our guiding question is the more compelling one. And by the classical view, I really mean the pre-modern view. So this would be a view that in its most formal uh, outline is shared by pagan philosophers in Greece and Rome. It was a view that got taken up into various forms of Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. Uh, and it's a view that is very marginalized within contemporary discourse, uh, most especially contemporary academic discourse. So part of the work that I try to do is to uh, make space for it within the academy. 
So the classical view really is that the purpose of human life and so the purpose of your life is to be happy and that this is only possible for us through the cultivation of qualities of characters that are known as the virtues. Because without the virtues, we just can't be happy. Um, so in other words, on the classical view, there's no life hack, there's no proper technique, there's no self-help um, that will help you to be happy. Really the only way to be happy or flourishing as a human being is to become and a good person, right? As if you wanna live well, you have to become a certain kind of person. Uh, so you have to undergo a certain kind of personal transformation. And that is to say, you have to become the sort of person who is capable of attaining real human excellence. Um, and that is not, not a technique. Um, virtue cannot be reduced to the category of technique. So basically what I want to do tonight is just elaborate this classical picture and explain as best as I can the connection between virtue and happiness and try to show how it overcomes uh, some of the more obvious failures of the contemporary view. So what the classical view foregrounds is a certain picture of human beings. And at its core is the claim that human beings are rational creatures. Right? And so what does it really mean to be rational? Well, it means that we have a self-conscious, self-determined form of life, which means that we don't merely perceive the world and react to the world based on perception, but that we see the world in light of general concepts and we make judgments and choices. So for example, um, I, I can see just something normal in every day, like a river. But I see it as more than an object of a particular color, shape, size, or smell. I see it as more than water. I see it as more than movement. I see it as a river, but not a stream or a lake or an ocean. I see it perhaps as something beautiful and powerful. I see it as something useful for a variety of my purposes, but I also perhaps see it as dangerous. It may be a place of memory for me. I may bring all sorts of imaginative ideas for it. I might find metaphor in a river. Um, and I think most importantly, I'm capable of experience, experiencing wonder as I view a river. And this wonder is the cause of my desire to have a deeper understanding of what I see. So I can wonder as I look at it, how it got there and how it might remain there. And this might eventually lead me to wonder about how everything got here. And finally, just about existence itself. And so all of this, um, <laughs> All of this stuff that's built into just seeing a river suggests that um, the vision of a, of a river of a, of a human being really differs pretty dramatically from that of other animals who also see, who also see the same thing, um, but they cannot and do not wonder about it or view it in relation to a conceptual and imaginative world whose possibilities seem infinite. That's characteristic of a rational animal. <laughs> And it's also characteristic of a rational animal that we have free choice, right? So my vision of the world guides my deliberation and my choices. And what I see and decide and choose uh, might have a lot of implications for other people. So the way that I see things uh, in the world affects how I interact with things in the world. That's true for animals as well, but I have this deep vision of life and the world, of what is valuable, of what is worthy of my attention, what the highest good is. And that affects what sort of life I wanna live, which dictates what sort of choices I wanna make. Um, and for this reason, I need to be attentive to the world, right? In a way that a mere animal doesn't. So I need to be attentive to the value that is really there to be seen, to be in tune with the world and to see it as it is. And this includes most especially seeing other people for who and what they really are. So whatever we're going to say about the point or purpose of human life or human happiness, it has to be articulated in light of the fact that we are rational creatures, that we seek to understand the world and seek what is good in light of that understanding. And that is to say, right, when we're reflecting about happiness, we're asking ourselves, again, how should we aspire to live and what sort of person do we most wish to become, right? It's, it's thought about the good. Um, I thought about human excellence. And um, whatever we end up saying happiness is, um, we're talking about whatever will most perfectly fulfill 
our capacities as rational creatures. Um, and whatever that turns out to be, that's going to be the proper measure of our lives and our actions. So an action, an individual action is going to be good or bad. Uh, it'll be good if it helps us to attain our characteristic flourishing or happiness, and it'll bad if it, if it doesn't do that. Um, so another way to put the point is that on the classical view, happiness is kind of our natural end. Happiness isn't something we choose. It's more like the condition for the possibility of rational choice. Um, you can think of it as kind of like the most basic human desire. Um, and again, I like to think of it as this vision um, according to which all of our choices are ultimately intelligible by reference to it. Now, it's also characteristic of the classical view that there's no hope of living a happy life in absence of becoming a, a person of good character. So virtue uh, for the Greeks, especially, literally means excellence. So the virtues are those excellent qualities of the human person that equip them to possess the goods that will make them happy, right? So you can think analogously, well, a young oak tree needs to develop strong roots in order to reach its mature stage of flourishing. Well, also young human beings need to cultivate the virtues in order to be happy or to flourish as human beings. Um, when you think about this sort of natural human search for happiness, one of my favorite books is St. Augustine's Confessions. So anybody who's read or taught the Confessions knows that Augustine believed from his own first personal experience uh, and also his philosophical conviction that our most basic human desire is for happiness, this kind of deep and lasting fulfillment. Right, so you, you kind of come away from reading the confessions, realizing that we really can't cease to wanna to be happy without ceasing to be human. And what's interesting about Augustine's story is, you know, Augustine is like so many ambitious, smart, talented people, so like, you know, the people that we teach in college. Um, but what's interesting about Augustine is that he really like thinks he knows what he wants in life. And he's also really successful, right? So Augustine is one of these people who gets what he wants. Um, and he wants things that, you know, prima facie are good, right? He, he wants a certain modicum of his success and, and certain pleasures, um, certain, honor, certain honors. Um, but the thing is that he gets these things and he ends up feeling sort of anxious and empty rather than deeply fulfilled. Um, and he has this uh, moment of clarity one day when he meets a beggar on the street. So here he is, he's a you know, successful, wealthy, attractive, young, young man, and he meets a beggar and he realizes to his shock and his dismay that the beggar is happier than he is. Um, and this is when Augustine comes to see that um, fulfillment, right? These, these kinds of more shallow fulfillments that he's been seeking are, are really not the target, right? right? That, that he's been going for the wrong things or that he's seeking his happiness in the wrong sorts of ends. Um, and from that moment on, really the search for Augustine is to find what will give him deep lasting, like sort of permanent happiness. Um, something that won't uh, fade off into anxiety and emptiness and, and just more longing, right? So he has famously, you know, this restless heart. <laughs> so in what will his heart really rest uh, and be satisfied? Now, uh, when, when I teach the classical view, which I do all the time, <laughs> uh, my, my students um, are, are very surprised, you know, to put it mildly. Um, and I think that's because we're trained you know, wh whether whether we're religious or secular, uh, it really doesn't matter. We're really trained to think of the moral life in terms of duties and obligations uh, and demands, right? So religious people tend to think of obedience to God's commands as what really matters for morality, whereas secular people uh, might think of duties to others or they might think of impersonal demands of justice, um, but they're just really not thinking of, of happiness at all, right? Um, if, if they're thinking about happiness um, or personal success, they're thinking that, well, that's something that, that has to happen, you know, once you have morality in, in place. And um, this creates a, a kind of a very problematic dualism uh, in our practical thought 
and our reason and our deliberation, right? Because it really becomes a matter of calculating costs and benefits and assessing trade-offs. You know, so the question becomes, well, should I do what will make me happy or should I do what's moral, <laughs> right? And once we have this dualism, the defining question of ethics uh, is no longer the classical question. It's, it's no longer what will make me happy, what will deeply satisfy me. Uh, but, but the question becomes, why should I be moral? <laughs> given, given the trade-offs, like what, why should I be moral? Um, you know, why, why should I sacrifice my personal well-being for morality? And, and this is just the assumption that the trade-off is there to be made. Um, and, I, and I think this is already a sign that we don't really understand what happiness is um, if we think of it as something at odds with or in competition with the moral life. Um, and I think a lot of this has to do with the way that we talk. The language of happiness is sort of very cheap and vulgar. Um, and this shows up in philosophy, right? So um, a philosopher colleague of mine, whom I like very much, Dan Habron, right? Uh, who, who writes and theorizes a lot about happiness. He says, happiness is roughly, right? To be happy is roughly for one's emotional condition to be broadly positive with only minor negatives, embodying a stance of psychic affirmation. So it's like cheerfulness, right? That's happiness. And it isn't just philosophers who have this view of happiness. They're uh, largely picking it up from the empirical scientists. And I will label this view subjectivism about happiness. So subjectivism is the view that happiness ought to be understood entirely in terms of an individual's first personal self-conscious psychic states, right? So happiness is, is a feeling you get that's positive. It's most especially associated with pleasures and other positive affective states. And a happy life is just one where there's a preponderance of these positive emotional affects. Now, there are more sophisticated forms of subjectivism that throw in some kind of cognitive element where you're supposed to be able to judge that your life is going well. Um, but it's important to note that this judgment is merely subjective. So there's no objective measure by which the judgment could be shown to be false, for example. So famously, if you're, a, if you're like a battered housewife, right? Um, who's, who's kind of beaten into submission. But if you can make a, a sincere judgment that you're satisfied with your life, and there are clear cases uh, where people can do this, um, then you're happy, right? <laughs> Even on the most sophisticated form of subjectivism. So contemporary subjectivist theories about happiness, um, the problem with them isn't just that they're shallow, although I do think they're shallow. Um, the problem is I just think they're false. <laughs> so uh, and here I think we can see that they suffer from two closely related flaws. So the first flaw is there's just too narrow a focus on individuals as a unit of assessment. So you're just looking at an individual and their psychological states, right? Nothing even outside the psychological state. Um, and this is related to the second problem, which is that it really opens up. So subjectivism opens up a really problematic dualism between the psychological perspective of the individual and the reality of their objective form of life, um, right? And so just to get you to kind of see the depth of the problem, uh, I'm gonna invite you to engage in a certain kind of thought experiment, right? Because I'm a philosopher and, and we really like those. Um, so what I want you to do is to imagine a kind of virtual reality machine that's just really advanced such that um, you don't know that it's virtual reality, like you think it's real. And once you're plugged into this virtual reality machine, you're just gonna seem to experience all the things that you really want in life. Love, security, professional success, pleasures of various kinds and degrees, and then all the bad stuff that you don't want, um, illness, failure, oppression, none of that stuff is gonna to happen to you. So once you're inside this virtual reality machine, um, you won't know that you're in a virtual reality machine. So you won't know that objectively your form of life is that like you're alone, you're not moving, you're being kept artificially alive and your brain is just kind of like being externally manipulated by this machine. Everything to you is going to appear to be real and to be really happening. And so the question is, would you choose to spend your life this way, right? Um, is this life aspirational for you, right? Is, is this what you think is worthy? Um, is this the sort of life you aspire to? Is such a life happy? Um, 
Now, I, I think you should say no to that question, but <laughs> like, but you, you should just ask the question and, and reflect on it in a sincere way. Now, theories that understand happiness solely in terms of subjective psychological states um, really can't say what the problem is with plugging yourself into this virtual reality machine, right? Um, because they have theories where, look, it's, it's just about positive affect. So if you can have a machine that just manipulates you into having these states, then we should just be able to say that you're happy. Um, but the thing is, the thing that's like really troubling about that is when you get in this machine, it's, it's not really true that your desires are satisfied, right? So no one really loves you. No one really desires you. None of this is real, right? You're not transacting with any real goods, right? But you feel like you are, right? So you, so you, get, you get the uptake that the good is supposed to give you, but you, but you don't actually get the good. Um, and so that really raises the question of what do you really want? Do you want what's really good or you just want the feeling that you get, right? From transacting with something that is good. Um, if you don't like that thought experiment, um, here's a, a slightly different imaginative scenario for you. So instead of thinking of individual choices, right? Cause it's just the choice whether or not I'm gonna get into this machine. You can think about what sort of society we might build around the subjectivist view of happiness. Um, I think this is basically the theme of Aldous Huxley's Brave New World. Um, so if you, if you haven't read Brave New World, um, this is Huxley's like dystopic future that he imagines. And in this future, everyone's healthy. So disease has basically been eradicated and nobody gets old and everybody's sort of really beautiful. Um, but what's really central to life in this society is psychotropic drugs, which are not really treated as medicine. They're, they're more like daily vitamins. So you take these pills every day when indicated and it's a kind of preventative measure. The pill is called Soma. And the pill is supposed to make you happy. It's like a happiness pill. And it is happiness in the subjectivist sense, right? So anytime that you're feeling sad or anxious or upset, or even just reflective about your life, you are instructed to take this pill to put you back in the proper state of mind so that you can really enjoy your life again. Now for Huxley, like it's, it's clear that this sort of happiness is deeply inhumane that it's at odds with our freedom as rational creatures, right? Who seek to reflect on what is true and pursue what's good. Because reflection and contemplation are considered like social diseases or defects in the brave new world, like they're bad. So they're discouraged and they're even punished. Uh, if you get too philosophical, you, you get exiled. Um, but as far as the architects of this society are concerned and, and they're very committed theoretically to this conception of happiness, they have achieved what they wanted. They've maximized happiness for everyone. They've made real progress through scientific rationalism. Um, you know, th th this is the happy city, right? Now the reader is supposed to be skeptical that anyone in the brave new world is actually happy. Like they're just drugged. They're drugged and they're distracted and they're slaves to a present that they can never transcend. And I think we're obviously meant to notice that there's no love. There's no real love in the society. There's a lot of sex, but there's no real love. There's only the satisfaction of bodily appetites, the consumption of material goods and the experience of cheap thrills, right? That's happiness. Everything feels good. There are no marriages, no families. There's no friendships. There's no real intimacy. Um, there's no sacrifice or suffering. There's no deeper meaning or purpose beyond pleasure which is the sum of one's world. And I think it's really clear that from Huxley's perspective anyway, that it's kind of a sad and pathetic world and deeply inhuman. Um, but again, the whole system is designed to promote this certain vision of happiness, but it's a happiness that's artificially induced through medical and social engineering. So, right, there are these two thought experiments. Do you wanna get inside the pleasure machine? Um, do you want to live in something like Huxley's Brave New World? I think these questions are really deeply related. 
they're related to the flaws that I see in subjectivism. And I think that if you're really a subjectivist about happiness, you have a hard time saying why we shouldn't really want to live um, in the brave new world or why we shouldn't really want to get in the, hap the um, happiness machine or, or the pleasure machine. Okay, so I think what these thought experiments isolate in a way that's helpful is that psychological subjectivism kind of masks the truth or the fundamental reality of the human person that the classical view really highlights, right? Which is that we're rational and therefore social and political animals that we fundamentally seek not pleasure, right? But the goods that give us pleasure. Um, and, and so I also think it brings to mind that we really can't lose sight of human nature when we think about the point of human life and about human happiness. Um, and one thing that is uh, deeply true about human beings is that we don't flourish alone or in isolation. Uh, maybe that's become <laughs> especially clear in the past year in this pandemic. Um, okay, so as a philosopher, I guess I just wanna make a, a few more distinctions that will be helpful in thinking about this. First is just a simple distinction between formal and material happiness. So formally happiness is just whatever completely satisfies you as a rational creature, right? Um, and we all want that, right? So, so when we talk about happiness as a desire that we all have, that we're all seeking, it's happiness in that formal sense. Um, but of course, it's also the case that everybody has like a completely different <laughs> notion of what happiness is. Um, and so that's a material conception of happiness. Like, what do you think will actually make you happy? Um, and so mostly tonight, I'm, I'm talking more about the, the formal stuff, um, but the formal stuff has implications for what might materially uh, be an appropriate object um, of the highest good or, or something that could actually uh, make people happy. Okay, so another aspect of the classical view that I want to discuss while we still have time is that on the classical view, friendship is essential to the happy life. Um, so Aristotle, you've probably heard of Aristotle. Um, Aristotle wrote this really famous treatise on ethics, the Nicomachean Ethics, and he opens book eight. So, so one thing to say about the Nicomachean Ethics, it's 10 books, two full books on friendship. So he talks about friendship more than he talks about anything else. Um, and I think that's really striking. Um, but here's how he opens book eight. He says, uh, no one would choose to live without friends, even if he had all other good things, right? So if you had like every human good that you can think of, um, you would still be unhappy if, if you could not share them with your friends. Um, so for Aristotle, it's just obvious that we need friends to be happy. But what is he thinking a friend is? What, what is friendship, um, you know, and why is it so essential to human happiness? Well, I mean, at its most basic sense, friendship is just reciprocal goodwill between two persons, right? So we have two persons who will one another's good and they seek to live one life together, right? So um, it's, it's, not, it's not just like well-wishing um, in a really abstract sense. You seek to live one life together. So it requires mutual affection and like-mindedness and some sort of equality between the participants. Um, you know, I, I can really love wine, but I can't be friends with wine, um, right? It's, <laughs> it's not the reciprocal good willing, um, right? In order to share life together, um, we have to be able to live, act, and think in a cooperative way. Um, so Aristotle is thinking of friendship as a unique kind of love between human beings that's based on a union of hearts and minds in particular. Um, and for that reason, friendship is only possible between rational creatures, right? So again, like, you know, people will say, well, do a dog is a man's best friend. That's false, <laughs> according to Aristotle, um, because... You know, you can love your dog and your dog can love you. Uh, Aristotle doesn't have to deny that, that your dog loves you and your dog's a great companion and it's totally wonderful. Um, but you just can't have a union of heart and mind with your dog because your dog doesn't have a heart and mind like a human person. 
Um, and the, the sign of this is that you cannot talk with your dog. You can talk to your dog, right? And, and you probably do all the time, but you cannot talk with your dog. You cannot have a conversation in which you both share your hearts and minds. And it's in conversation that the love of friendship primarily grows. And so I, I think that's essential to it, right? We're a, we're a talking kind of creature. Um, now I've mentioned that in friendship, right? There's this mutual uh, reciprocal good willing. And so in friendship, Aristotle says, one takes the good of a friend as an essential part of one's own good, such that the happiness of the friend becomes inseparable from one's own happiness. And that's really key to friendship. And that means that for Aristotle, friendship's a common good. Common good is contrasted with a private good. <clears throat> um, a quintessential private good would, would be pleasure, right? Um, you know, we can both experience pleasure doing something, but like you have your pleasure and, and I have my pleasure. Um, I can do things to give you pleasure, but it's still your pleasure that you're experiencing. Um, a common good isn't like that. So there are three senses of common to a common good. The first is that it's common to all human beings. So it belongs to our nature to seek and enjoy this kind of good. The second is that it's not competitive. So my pursuit of this good in no way um, detracts from your pursuit of it. So like if I get wisdom, there's it's not like there's less wisdom left for you. Um, it's not a competitive good. Um, and also, and this is really important, it's never the sole possession of an individual. So that means that the enjoyment of the good um, only comes about in activities in which others also participate such that the good is enjoyed. So the good is both brought about together and it's enjoyed together. So you can just like think of a symphony, right? Um, if you're like a French horn player, um, you've got your part in the symphony, but it doesn't matter how much you play, how greatly you play your part, like you can't bring the symphony off on your own. So you all, you all bring the symphony into being together um, and it cannot come to be in any other way. Everybody has to play their part and you can really only fully enjoy the symphony together, right? So that's the sense in which it is a participatory good. Um, and in this, in this sense, happiness between friends is, is a common good, right? Uh, friendship is common to the human, right? Um, the goods of friendship are goods that the friends participate in and enjoy together. And we're not in competition with our friends, right? We rejoice in their good when it is attained and we sorrow when harms befall them, right? And so friendship kind of involves the cultivation of friendship and the maintenance of friendship involves a kind of loving that can only come to be and be maintained through a self-transcendent perspective in which one comes to see one's life and one's action in relation to a greater whole, right? So a friend understands himself as a part in the sense of participant in a union of affection and will with other people, right? And insofar as you take up this practical perspective, you don't see your happiness as just yours. It's not a private good, right? Your happiness now is inextricably bound up with the happiness of your friends, right? And this kind of loving communion with another person, right, is the stuff of truly happy lives on the classical view. Um, and it's also important on the classical view that friendship is the context both for the cultivation of and the exercise of virtue, right? And this, for, for reasons I don't fully get, this tends to drop out of even contemporary understandings of Aristotle. So um, I, I, I always tell my students, you know, one of the most famous books on Aristotle's ethics only mentions friendship in a footnote. And that is astonishing. <laughs> That's astonishing because literally he talks about it more than anything else in the ethics. Um, so we, we would do well to think about uh, why that is the case. Why is it even that modern interpreters, um, these are Aristotle scholars who know their Greek and know their history. Why is it that they miss the importance of 
friendship for virtue even. Um, and, and I, and I think it's bound up with how entrenched, uh, the contemporary view is that we read it back even into, um, proponents of the classical view, but the classical tradition, including Aristotle, that goes well beyond it. The classical tradition teaches that virtues, right. are habits or dispositions that perfect our natural human powers of thought, action, and feeling and desire such that they reliably act in accordance with right practical reason for the sake of living well or being happy, right? That is the point of virtue. And um, the virtue can only come to be, so nobody's born virtuous, right? You have to become virtuous and you only become virtuous with and through others, right? Especially, uh, through conversation, right? So, uh, if, if we think about, and we study, and there's been a lot of really great empirical work on the, on the cultivation of virtue that, that sort of bears this out, you know, we, <clears throat> we come to express virtue, um, not by just modeling correct behavior to young children, but by explaining it to them, by talking it through, right? Um, in conversation. And so, this sort of um, shows that the proper context of virtue, both its cultivation and its exercise is in friendship, right? And it's important to mention that friendship for Aristotle is very capacious, right? So the parent-child relationship is a kind of friendship. The spousal relationship is a kind of friendship. And there's even a kind of friendship between citizens, which Aristotle thinks is necessary for justice and necessary for the happy city. Um, so, so really the main work of virtue is that it allows us to see the value of other persons and to lovingly respond to that value, right? So virtue is what allows us to love other people so that we can live one life together. And again, this kind of like goes back to the fact that we are rational social animals. Um, and it's also through the development of virtue um, that I, I am happy in a way to make sacrifices and to suffer for my friends. So I don't think of it as a trade-off, right? I don't think like, oh, I'll help out Jim, even though it sucks for me, right? If, if, if I love Jim with the love of friendship, right, then I'm happy to do it for, for our sake, really, for the sake of our friendship. Um, and, and I think that it's, it's really important to virtue, uh, to see virtue in this light. Um, and so here I'll, I'll, I'll quote a medieval Aristotelian, which is Thomas Aquinas, who says that in friendships, the part, right, the friend, does indeed love the good of the whole, the, the friendship, not however so as to refer the good of the whole to itself, but rather itself to the good of the whole, right? So a good parent ultimately prefers the goods of the family over just his private goods, um, right? So it's, a, so it's a sacrifice, but it's not a sacrifice that is painful. Um, so really, as we grow in virtue, we learn to think, feel, and act in ways that go beyond the self. And we expand our sense, um, we expand our sense of the self such that the good of others becomes inseparable from our own good. So that means I see my happiness as something shared in common and enjoyed with others. And as we grow in virtue, again, we become happy to sacrifice for others, again, because we see it as part of our happiness. Um, and we may even reach the condition in which we would joyfully lay down our lives for others. This is the life of true friendship in which we take joy in flourishing together. And we cannot imagine ourselves flourishing alone or at the expense of our friends, right? And this, I think, leads me to, you know, maybe the last point that I'll make about our desire for happiness, and that is that it's not really satisfied just in us, right? So we seek a good that is outside of ourselves, a good in which we participate, but really is greater than ourselves. Um, and this, I think, subjectivism and contemporary theories of happiness simply cannot account for. So that's the classical view. I think that it's superior uh, to contemporary views. Um, I've been looking at it sort of in a theoretical way, but just as a closing thought, I want to remind you that, you know, it's, it's a really practical, it's a really practical uh, question. And uh, so I think ultimately we have to think about it from a first personal deliberative perspective, right? And um, given the pandemic, 
right? It's been sort of a perfect opportunity for us to step back and to reflect on our lives and what we're doing and, you know, sort of like, what are we going for and why we're going for it? Um, and so I think, you know, it's really good to reevaluate the goals of your life in virtue, uh, sorry, uh, in light of the sort of classical framework, right? What is your vision of the good that guides, right? Your choices. Is it something that really will bring you lasting and deep fulfillment? Or are you sort of in the sort of position that St. Augustine was in where you get what you want, but it just kind of leaves you feeling anxious and like you want more? Um, what sort of person do you aspire to be? And how does that relate to your vision of the good life? These are really practical questions. And these are the questions about the purpose or point of human life. Okay, I'm over time. So I'll just say thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Jennifer Frey, for that uh, wonderful, I would say exemplary EKU Chautauqua and Ron Messerich lecture. Um, with uh, you know, wonderful application of so many classical ideas uh, to practical questions, right, of purpose in life. I think you just did an, an admirably clear job of taking, you know, some very difficult and potentially challenging concepts and bringing them to bear upon obviously things that are of fundamental concern, right, to everybody. And I totally agree with you that um, the pandemic, I think, has maybe given us an opportunity, uh, not initially wanted, but an opportunity to pause and consider you know, how we can expand ourselves, how we can um, commit with more uh, purpose, more intention and to the common good and to friendships, et cetera, such as we have here at EKU Chautauqua. And I use that as a segue to the um, very active scrolling uh, set of comments <laughs> and questions that our viewers have uh, put in a flood in the YouTube chat. Um, I don't even know that I'm going to be able to find my way back through all of it. Um, but as I start to do that, maybe I'll invite Mike to uh, chime in if he has a, a, a burning thought or question to get us uh, going into Q&A. Maybe, I don't know, I guess it's a thought I had. So it goes back to the, that our good is bound up with the good of others. So we cultivate virtue in conversation. And then, as you talked about via friendship, broadly conceived, so I actually said this in the chat, I was like participating and listening because, you know, we've learned that skill this past year. <laughs> um, but I, I just wonder what you think about, like in, in our particular context in the United States, this, there's this irony of sorts that we have this ideal of rugged individualism of independence. And yet if the classical view is right, which I tend to think it is, what we're doing is actually undermining our happiness as we kind of try to seek it out on our own, right? Because we, we, we end up neglecting the common good and we don't realize that, that our good is bound up in the common good. Um, so I guess, I don't know if that's a question as much as like, how would you, what would you say to somebody who thinks I don't need others in this way? Maybe they would reject this view. They would just say, I need to get what I want. Yeah, I want to cultivate virtue. I want to be a good person to my inner circle of, you know, maybe my family and a few friends, but then I've got to get what I want. Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, you know, it's helpful to switch from, you know, the way that we tend to present this in like a moral philosophy class is ordered around the question like, why should I be just or why should I be moral? And I think that, you know, the, the better um, way of coming about it is asking like, well, what, what really is going to make you happy? Like what's actually going to satisfy you? And um, tr try to talk to people more on that level. Now there's no, here's the thing, there's no technique. <laughs> there's no rational technique. There's no argument that you can make that is going to necessarily like work in the sense that they're gonna change their life, right? I think the best that philosophy can do is um, present, you know, a, a certain kind of vision. Um, and I think <laughs> it's, it's either a vision that people are going to connect with. They're going to see that, you know, this connects with their experience. This, this seems true to them, um, or they're not. And in the cases where, you know, it doesn't 
they, they, they don't see it. Right. Like they're like, no, I'm, I'm going to go my own way. And I'm going to, I'm going to be after power and fame and pleasure. Um, look, power and fame and pleasure are, well, let's not say fame, let's say honors <laughs> in the more Greek sense. Those are actually like really good things. Um, it's not bad to be given an award for excellence. It's good if you've really done an excellent thing, but it's just that all of those things, unless they're ordered to something higher and in the proper context of friendship, um, they just aren't going to give you a kind of lasting fulfillment, right? Because you win the honor. Um, and, th and this is this is empirically so well documented, right? So, so people who win a lot of honors um, and are very successful at what they do, um, it doesn't give them lasting happiness. And in fact, those people are more likely to end up in suicide, right? Than just kind of everyday folk. And, and I think, you know, maybe part of that explanation is there, they were expecting this, right? To be it, right? Like, like I won the, you know, I won the great prize, right? Um, and it, it is very thrilling for a short time. There's no denying it, but then there is this crash, like, okay, well now there's the rest of my life. <laughs> you know, I do have this coda next to my name, but, and in fact, it's also true that, you know, as, as people age and as people get close to death, they don't care at all about their honors. They don't care at all about their accomplishments. Um, what they care about is the relationships that they have and the people that they love who are there with them. Um, and so I think, you know, you, <laughs> but people will resist this. And there, I'm, and, and I don't, there's no, <laughs> there's no life hack there. There's no technique. There's no proper way of teaching. Uh, you know, I think Plato was right. You, you can't really teach virtue in the sense that you can't teach in such a way that you're guaranteed to transform a soul, right? Because in teaching, you're acting on, right? There's the teacher and the one taught and the transformation really has to come from the one taught. Teacher can only do so much. If I remember correctly, Aristotle also talks about how you can develop your character uh, to become more virtuous. Yes. It, yeah. it, would you consider that to be a technique or not a technique or, you know, in, in a practical sense, that is to say that people can say, okay, I want to be more courageous. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not a courageous person yet, but if I do courageous acts or attempt to and throw myself down that path, eventually I'll have a, I forget how Aristotle puts it, a consolidated mm -hmm. character or propensity mm -hmm. to act that way. What, what, were you excluding that from a technique? Yes. Yeah. So Aristotle, so? And Plato, Aristotle and Plato both are very clear. So they have this virtue craft analogy. So they're like, well, virtues and techne, right? Arte and techne are, are like in many respects. They're both habits, right? Um, they both require a certain kind of training, um, but ultimately they're very different. Um, and there are several ways that Aristotle tries to bring out the difference. One is that um, if you have internalized a technique, so some external practice that you um, internalize so that you can produce the relevant thing, uh, you can produce the relevant product or craft, um, you can exercise your technique in a bad way at, for, for a bad end as an exercise of that technique. So for example, as a shoemaker, I can make a bad shoe as an exercise of my shoemaking, right? So like if I'm teaching shoemaking, I can be like, you don't do it like this and I do it incorrectly. And that is a manifestation of my expertise, right? You cannot do that with virtue, right? So I cannot manifest my virtue um, by murdering someone to show you, like, don't do that. <laughs> um, and, and I mean, it sounds like a silly point, but <laughs> I think actually it's very deep. 
Um, it gets to the heart of the difference between technique and virtue because virtue really is a transformation of the person and technique is the acquisition of a skill, right? So, so I can be highly skilled and not transformed at the right level. Um, and there's no exercise of a virtue for a bad outcome. And there is absolutely exercise of the skill for a bad outcome voluntarily. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, um, I don't know if there's a segue here or not, but uh, I, I'd like to read some questions uh, from our audience. Uh, one is from Matt, Matt Winslow, um, asking you, how do we decide if our happiness is true or false, formal or material? Yeah, okay, yeah. So um, so I, I would say that like formal happiness is just um, th thinking of happiness as that which the heart desires, right? So you're, so you're not saying yet yeah, like what happiness consists in, but you're just recognizing that there is this desire for fulfillment that sort of structures your practical reasoning and makes sense of your choices. But material happiness is like, what is your specific vision of that, right? And then the question is, well, how do I know if my vision is true or false? Good question. <laughs> um, yeah, right, that's like sort of the million dollar question. Um, now it's all, it's all, it's a question for the, for the classical view in a way that it's, it's not the question. I mean, there is, this question doesn't come up for the subjectivist. Um, and, and here I think, um, again, we, we have to go back to human nature, right? So when we think about whatever objective human flourishing is, and I didn't give an account of it, right? All I said was you need the virtues and it'll be, it'll make you like deeply happy and fulfilled, but I didn't tell you what it is. Maybe it's contemplation of God. Like I didn't commit myself, but whatever it is, um, I would say that as you're as you're thinking about what it is, again, you have to think be thinking about it as what's going to most deeply uh, fulfill me as a specifically human being, right? And if you look at, for example. It's just a, sort of like a classic medieval Christian Aristotelian text, which is uh, Thomas Aquinas's Summa Theologiae. Um, he has this, you know, we call it the treatise on happiness, but it's really just a, a chunk of the Summa where he's talking about what happiness is. And that's exactly how he reasons, right? So Thomas ends up answering in the exact same way as Aristotle did like the highest good is contemplation of God. That is Aristotle's answer. That is Plato's answer. Um, but how did he get to it, right? Well, in a, in a way, it, it's, a, it's a similar to the way that Plato and Aristotle get to it. They're reflecting on our specifically human capacities, right? Our capacity to know and understand the world and to make choices in light of that understanding. And so, um, you know, Aquinas gets to the conclusion uh, which is slightly different from Aristotle's insofar as Aristotle's world is eternal, not created. Um, but Aquinas says, well, look, no finite good can satisfy reason, which is really an infinite capacity, right? So that our, um, our capacity to know the truth is never exhausted, right? Um, so as wise as you might become, you could still be wiser. Um, and so he thinks like the only thing that'll permanently satisfy us is being itself, namely God. Um, so it turns out that your perfect happiness is the beatific vision. But, you know, you, if, if, if you don't believe in God, then obviously you're not going to reach that <laughs> answer. That answer is not going to be available to you. But, some, but you can still have, I mean, you can think of somebody like Iris Murdoch, right? who has a very contemplative vision of the good human life, but she, she doesn't believe in God, right? So she doesn't believe in perfect uh, fulfillment. Neither did Aristotle, by the way, right? Aristotle thought whatever happiness we could have for ourselves, it would be fragile and imperfect, which is sort of like why he talks about tragedy in the Nicomachean ethics. Um, it's a fragile thing, our happiness. Um, Look, somebody like Aquinas thinks it's a fragile thing in this life, 
right? But it's a permanent thing in the next. So it depends on what you think about human nature, whether you think we have an immortal soul, but I think it's basically whatever your answer is, your reflection will be guided by what is it to be a human being? Because the answer, what is it to be a human being is going to be directly related to the question of what is going to really, what sort of good is going to most deeply lastingly fulfill us as the kind of thing that we are. Um, and there are all kinds of secular philosophers um, who are thinking in that way, right? Philippa Foot, Iris Murdoch, uh, more recently Tao Brewer, um, who I think does amazing work. Um, so it's, it doesn't have to have um, a theistic, it doesn't have to have a theistic take. In all those cases, would you say that some of the common factors are to, you know, touch upon some of the concepts you mentioned, that it has to involve rationality and objectivity and something that transcends one's own personal sphere? Yes, you know, I would say. Exactly. Some people, you know, get that sustaining um, value out of contributing to science or, you know, do something else in their yeah. uh, community, but it's not necessarily you know, the thinking of thinking of on thinking, yeah. uh, the contemplation yeah. of God or the beatific yeah. vision. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, there's a sense in which, I mean, for Plato and Aristotle, the highest good is, is Sophia, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's contemplating, well, it's contemplating, which requires Sophia, but, um, you know, the goodness of your contemplation depends on the goodness of your objects of contemplation. Like if you just contemplated the phone book, like, that doesn't really seem worthy of your attention. <laughs> you know? uh, that doesn't seem wise. Um, but like, if you don't think that there is Aristotle's God or Aquinas's God, you can still think about what is most worthy of your attention, right? Um, and, and for Murdoch, the answer is sort of like reality, the world, right? What Aquinas would call creation. Um, and that includes the reality of other people. Okay, I actually do have a kind of segue here to another question that a viewer had uh, about hermetic monasticism. You know, um, presumably uh, hermetic yeah. monks are contemplating God, but they're not involved in close friendships of the Aristotelian sort. But and they so, are. Like, okay, well, maybe you can expand on that because the question is, and I think this um, was posted when you were talking precisely about, uh, you know, Aristotelian friendship. Um, this seems to eliminate the possibility of hermetic monasticism as being virtuous. No. Okay. No, because in the Christian tradition, and this is very important, of course, I didn't talk about it because it's not the kind of talk I'm giving, but in the Christian tradition, caritas, charity, which is the highest virtue, the form of the virtues, is friendship with God. So they absolutely have friendship. And in fact, it's the heart of their life. Um, and in fact, their life is prayer. And what is prayer? It's conversation with God. And so through prayer, they are growing in friendship with God and intimacy with God. And so they absolutely have what Aristotle was talking about, not on Aristotle's terms, because Aristotle famously, and really the Greeks in general, thought that friendship with, with God was impossible. It was silly. Um, this is a very Christian this is a very Christian idea and it comes right out of the gospels. Yeah. It's a good question. Thank you. Um, Mike, uh, feel free to jump in if and when you have a comment or if you see something else in the uh, chat that you want to um, share. Um, but here's another question in the meantime from Chloe. Um, do you think there was a shift of focus from cultivation of the common good to that of self-fulfillment? Uh, or do you believe that mankind has always been neglectful of friendship and that common right, participatory notion? Yeah, that's a good question. Thank you. Uh, I think there was a shift, right? I really think this is the shift from pre-modernity to modernity and, and the shift is to a kind of liberal order, right? Where a liberal political order where friendship becomes relegated to the private sphere. And so one of the most dramatic things that you can do in terms of contrast is read Aristotle's politics and then read Thomas Hobbes, right? Where you start to see 
a view of political life in which friendship is the essential concept and a view of political life where it's meaningless. It doesn't even come up. Like, why would you talk about friendship? Right? Because it has nothing to do with this thing I'm calling the state. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think it, I think it came with a kind of revolution and, you know, the means of organizing ourselves and our self-conception as, as political animals. And, um, one of the things that I think is most challenging for an Aristotelian is for their ethics to not just be an ethics of nostalgia right? So how is it that you're going to realize this, right? Given the massive political institutional shifts that came along with modernity, right? And that I think is, is the most difficult question that, that Aristotelians really face. Um, so yeah, I think there was a major shift, major. For those of um, us uh, and our viewers out there who are interested to um, to steal themselves and to, to, I guess, get more wherewithal to uh, fight against some of the contemporary trends and the degradation of the classical worldview. Uh, George asks, uh, what, now you mentioned some books and some writers, philosophical and otherwise, but what uh, books uh, by modern commentators on the classical view of happiness uh, might you recommend? I know that you know, there's been all kinds of books out there on, you know, ancient uh, wisdom for modern life and neo-Stoicism and so on. What are some of the, of those books that you would recommend that would give people even, you know, more insight and tools, I guess, to, to kind of not just be nostalgic about yeah. ancient world, but to actually, you know, try to live their lives more or less in accord with those principles you've been sharing tonight? Yeah, so I think it depends on, um, your self-conception, <laughs> I guess, you know, sort of like what strand of this tradition you, you know, because one of the things about the classical view that on the one hand is, is really great is just how capacious it is, right? So it has adapted itself to secular forms. There are uh, different religious forms of it, right? So there are Jewish forms of Aristotelianism and Christian forms of it. And there are Christian forms of Platonism. Um, and so I, I think it, it sort of depends on what tradition you're coming out of, depending on what I would recommend. But just at the level of philosophy, I think that, um, you know, Alistair McIntyre is a philosopher who um, is, is both a really good philosopher and, a, and I think accessible and, and his writings are accessible. You know, I, I first read Alistair when I was 18 and I, and I really hadn't read much philosophy in it kind of made me want to be a philosopher. <laughs> so, so I think um, Alistair McIntyre's view uh, book after virtue um, is, is pretty incredible. Um, and um, I, I think Joseph Pieper, who is working more in the Thomist tradition um, is just a fantastic writer, a, so accessible. He has a book called the Cardinal Virtues uh, which is which is really wonderful. And he also has a book on the theological virtues, faith, hope, and love, um, which really gets into this this notion of of caritas uh, that that I was discussing. Um, so so I would recommend both of those um, as as really good starting points. Um, and yeah, just just kind of see where that leads you. Um, I also think C.S. Lewis is some, some of his writing is, is pretty good on this and, and he's super accessible, but of course, again, he's coming from a more Christian perspective. Thank you. I, I think Mike's taking care of the chat. <laughs> so yeah. I'll, I'll press on with a couple more questions or Mike, go ahead. If you well, no, I was, Yeah, I do. I was look, trying to look go for ahead. a question. So this one just, so ha someone mentioned or said in the chat, um, if friendship with God counts, as friendship, then can you call worship of anything else like among your honors friendship also? And so maybe there's, well, I won't say what I think. What do you, so what's the difference there? It, I guess the idea is you, as long as you're worshiping something and you can have friendship with God, replace human beings, can you have friendship with stuff or honors? No, I don't think you can have friendship with stuff. Yeah. I think it's, it's more appropriate to say you can be friends with your dog, even though I don't think you can really be friends with your dog, um, than it would be to say you can be friends with 
stuff, right? You absolutely can't be friends with stuff. Um, sometimes I think like something that I think about, so sometimes jokingly, but not jokingly, I'm like, you know, my best friends are Aristotle and Aquinas. <laughs> I think I've literally spent more time with them <laughs> than like other people besides my kids and my husband. Um, but you know, they're dead. <laughs> right? <laughs> um, but no, you, 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 you can't be friends with, um, with, with stuff, right? I mean, you can worship stuff. You shouldn't, but you can. Um, you can worship them in the sense that you can make them the highest good, right? And so you can order your whole life towards fame or power or money. People do this. Um, I, think it's a, I think it's a big mistake. I, I think empirically, it's just been demonstrated <laughs> to be a big mistake. I don't think anybody who does that ends up being anything other than a completely miserable, awful person. Um, right. What, what about nature? Is nature something you can have a friendship with in that sense? You know, it, and no. kind of, no. Yeah, okay. no. I mean, you can also worship nature and, and people definitely do. Um, but no, I don't think you can be friends with nature again because nature, there's not the reciprocal you know, there's, there's not the reciprocal good willing that develops through conversation. You know, that, that, that's really the essence. I, um, I think I was asking as a kind of um, extension of the question about how is that not analogous to uh, friendship with or devotion to God? Mm -hmm. And, I, in, I, you know, in this context, as a modern sort of um, uh, example of this, you know, I think of Spinoza who talks about God or nature. Yeah. Yes. Or it's all the time. And so nature in the sense of, you know, the, all that there is and with mm -hmm. the energy and everything else mm -hmm. that is expressed there in, mm -hmm. um, is that something that you think could be fulfilling in the classical sense? Oh yeah. I see. Okay. I see what you're asking. Yeah. Um, you know, it's interesting. Like I, um, I'm really interested in the writing of John Muir <laughs> Um, so, so, you know, J John Muir is responsible for our national park system and, um, his, his argument, you know, there were two kinds of arguments there, there are still today, two kinds of arguments for conservationism. One is utilitarian and one is John Muir style, intrinsically good arguments. And, and what Muir, um, thinks is that, um, you know, he, he called what became the national parks. Um, he called them secular cathedrals. And he thought that going in them was a kind of a religious experience, right? Where you, you feel this awe and wonder and um, this, this kind of transcendence, which again is empirically borne out. We, we know that people do experience awe and wonder in these places. And um, so he thinks that going to these places is, is like essential um, to, to your fulfillment as a, as a human being. Like you should have these experiences. They make you better. Um, and I think that's, there's something cor correct about that. Um, there's, there is something very important in human life about the experience of wonder and awe, Aristotle himself talks about wonder as the beginning of philosophy. And uh, um, so I'm inclined to agree with him that this is very important. But the, but the thing is, like, these experiences of wonder uh, don't last, for one thing. Um, and they're more, they're more like the starting points than the end points, right? Um, and, and I think Muir kind of has that insight, too, right? That um, but it, but it is a kind of contemplative wonder. And so, um, somebody like, uh, Dworkin, Jerry Dworkin actually wrote a book about how this kind of communion with nature, um, is a kind of atheistic religion, right? This is ultimately a, a book about why, um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's ultimately a book about 
what should be constitutionally guaranteed. And he thought religious claims of conscience or non-religious claims of conscience should be constitutionally guaranteed. But, but he gets by starting from this, atheism can be a, considered a kind of religion. Um, and he's coming out of this same tradition. So I do think they can function in the same way. Um, it, it's not crazy, no. Um, but I, but I, yeah. I mean, I, I guess that's that's all I'll say. There's there's definitely a tradition of thinking in this way, and and it's and it's not crazy by any stretch. Well, a kind of connection to I don't know if it's a question or a comment uh, that one of our uh, colleagues Jason had um, from Thoreau. Um, ah, yeah, yeah. It kind of connects to this notion, right, of, of finding your transcendence in uh, your relationship to nature. Mm -hmm. uh, said, yeah. Jason shares a quote from Thoreau and asks, I guess, whether you think he was right, what you think about it. Happiness is like a butterfly. The more you chase it, the more it will evade you. But if you notice the other things around you, it will gently come and sit on your shoulder. Yeah. I mean, I think that's really close to what Mill writes about in his autobiography when he, ta when he talks about the paradox of happiness. So like if you explicitly seek happiness, like you'll be miserable. <laughs> <laughs> so like, don't do that. Um, nevertheless, the goal of life is to be happy. Um, I, I think that there's something true about it. And that is, don't, don't always be thinking about what's in it for you, right? Don't always be thinking about happiness as your private good, which I think is the natural tendency for all of us because we're trained to think of it in that way. Um, that, yeah, your happiness will come, as Thoreau says, by noticing the good things around you. Um, and that, I think, speaks to something that is true, which is that happiness is something you experience, but it's not fundamentally something in you, right? It's, it's your experience of a good that is outside you or goods that are outside you. Um, and, and so I think that's true. I mean, I just now am like, really trying to reckon with Thoreau in a, in a serious way. Um, I find Thoreau very, very interesting because on the one hand, he has a very keen um, appreciation of contemplation and the value of contemplation. On the other hand, he's kind of in this rugged individualist sort of stranded things and mirrors too, in a way. And so I think it's like, I don't know, I'm, I'm trying to make sense of of this. And I haven't made sense of it yet. So don't ask me. <laughs> so. and, I won't, but I, <laughs> if I can kind of uh, follow up on that, are there connections between what you are describing um, and uh, ancient Eastern ways of thinking, you know, and getting beyond the self? And yeah. I, I noticed you mentioned the term attunement early on in your talk. Yeah. You know, something I associate with Taoism, that is to say there, there is this you know, way out there, but if you try to articulate it or grab hold of it or catch it like a butterfly, it will elude you. Yeah. But, you know, I wonder when you think in term in classical terms, whether you would insist upon there being a kind of uh, definite content to the goal or the purpose that you started out with, or whether it can be more intuitive, more like the uncarved block or something of that sort. So what, you know, what do you think about that set of um, questions. Yeah, yes, yeah, so that's really good. So um, I have two things to say about that. The, the first is that um, one of the things that became clear to me, I, I had this like three year research project on virtue, happiness and, and meaning of life. And we had a bunch of scholars of Eastern religion and, and Eastern philosophy on that project. And um, one of the things that became really clear to me is that the classical view is not just a Western view. And I think that's um, really kind of powerful in a way, you know? Um, so in Confucius and Mencius um, and a bunch of other thinkers, you see this, this, the same kind of formal framework, right? Now, and, and you see a lot of the same virtues, although there are sort of distinctively, I, I shouldn't say they're distinctive Eastern virtues, but the virtues take uh, a, a slightly different, they take on a slightly different character. So, you know, piety takes on a slightly different character um, in, the, in the Confucian tradition. 
Um, nevertheless, they, they have a notion of piety, which is recognizably piety. Um, but again, it, it is ordered to living well, to flourishing, and it is tied to a conception of human nature, right? Um, and so I do think we see this, this resonance, right, with Eastern strands of thought. Um, to the second point about whether or not you have to have a really specific vision of the good life, um, no, I, I don't think that you do. I think that most of us refine our vision of good, of our vision of the good life as we go on. And this is something that Tao Brewer in a book that is academic, but really wonderful. It's called The Retrieval of Ethics. Um, and he has a beautiful account of this um, and a critique of contemporary theories of practical reason that um, don't allow for this kind of dialectical revision of, of our vision as we go on in life and, and as we learn and as we become better people, our vision changes. Um, and so, no, I, I don't think that you have to have it figured out in the beginning. Augustine didn't, he had no clue what he was doing like forever. <laughs> and it's, and even, even after he becomes a Christian, right? He's slowly becoming more, um, you know, I, I don't think you ever just have it figured out. Um, well, yeah. in, in that connection, Tom just uh, commented that the ineffable way of the Tao may indeed capture an important aspect of reality relative to us, but the Greek asper aspiration to conceptual clarity seems to offer more progress than we would imagine. So there's this notion that wherever the, you know, the Greek uh, impulse towards rationality and analysis is and dialectic, right, is taking us, it's somewhere that we don't, we can't foresee. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, yeah, I agree with that. But I would also say that, um, you know, the Greeks, especially Plato, um, really had a, profound sense of the spiritual and the mysterious, right? Um, and, and not just in the character of Socrates, um, but you know, we, we can never forget that Socrates always claimed he didn't know anything, <laughs> right? Um, and that humility is the beginning of wisdom and that um, all we can do is contemplate the forms, um, but we never fully possess them. Um, and so I think for Plato, you know, especially the form of the good is inexhaustible. It's not like, oh yeah, I know that now. Oh, I just, I know the good. <laughs> Check that off my list. <laughs> no, it's, you never just know the good. It's, it's inexhaustible. There's some, that, so in the sense, so, so that's the sense of mystery, not in the sense of like mystery novel, I've got to figure it out, but the sense of like, it's inexhaustible. Like as much as I can know about it, I won't, I won't really have even come close to exhausting that. Um, and so I think in the Greeks, you find this balance between this desire to understand, to have conceptual clarity, but then also this recognition that you were finite and limited and the true and the good and the beautiful are infinite things that we can try to grasp as much as we can, but we'll never, we'll never fully possess them. Mike, were you going to chime in? If not, I've got at least a couple more questions here to ask, and then we'll probably wrap it up. Go ahead. No, yeah, it was actually just one of the questions. Maybe somebody asked if you are, are working on this, like in like in an academic sense. If you and I thought I remember, do you have a, a sauce that you're working on a book related to some of these themes? Is that right? Yeah. Try. Okay. Yeah. So maybe just <laughs> say something briefly most, about. Wasn't the most productive year. <laughs> <laughs> well, really. <laughs> Yeah, I'm just glad to get my classes taught and in bed. I'm just glad I'm still alive. Yeah, yeah that too. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm I'm working on three books right now. Two are just edited volumes. One is on practical wisdom that I'm really excited about. Um, and the other's on practical truth, which is related. Um, I'm, I'm like trying to revive the concept of practical truth. I don't know if it's gonna work, but I'm gonna try. And uh, you know, somebody asked me like, how do you know if it's true? I'm, I'm trying to think about that. Um, 
but my my book book the one that's a manuscript is yeah on virtue and action so what i'm mainly interested in is the relationship between um the the what do i want to say the manifestation of virtue and uh you know intentional action and and the moral psychology behind that um but it's also central to that book uh the question about whether or not practical reason has an internal telos or goal right and i want to say that it does <laughs> um and that actually an analysis of virtue and action can show us that it does so because it's very difficult you know i can give a talk about virtue and happiness to normal, highly educated people who are not trained in analytic philosophy. And they're like, oh, it's so cool and interesting. And then I can go talk to analytic philosophers and they're like, this is crazy. <laughs> like you're a crazy person. <laughs> and it's like, I don't know, maybe it's not crazy. So you really have to, um, you really have to do so much conceptual spade work to even get people to allow you to say the word the highest good or happiness in the meaningful sense. Um, and so that that's the kind of work I'm, I'm trying to do. Yeah. Thank you. I think uh, I'll ask you one more question and then wrap things up. Uh, we have a question from Matt Pinalto, one of our colleagues. Um, what do you make of the similarities or differences between Epicurean hedonism, right? So a classic ancient form of hedonism and the contemporary hedonism that you reject? Well, Epicurean, Epicurean hedonism is so much more interesting, um, actually. <laughs> um, I haven't taught Epicurus in like two years now, so it's not super fresh in my head, but Epicurus um, in a lot of ways sounds like Plato and Aristotle, you know? Um, and then, I mean, you can see where he doesn't, right? But it's not, um, you know, we have this caricature of Epicurus, which is not fair to him. Um, you know, I think he was a very serious, in, in a way, he was, he was a very serious uh, philosopher. Um, and, you know, he's got a hedonism that's very rigorous. <laughs> it's very demanding sort of hedonism. Um, but at the end of the day, um, he thinks that the goal is this kind of freedom from pain, you know? Um, and, and I think that's incorrect. Um, I think that's incorrect because I think that pain is not intrinsically bad. I think that suffering is not intrinsically bad. And I think that suffering is uh, often, this is something that I'm writing about. Um, what well, one, I think suffering is inevitable. And so it's just sort of part of a flourishing life, right? Um, a flourishing person is still going to suffer. It, you, in part because you can't love anyone without suffering and you can't love anyone without making meaningful sacrifices. And so if loving other people is like central to the good life, then so is suffering and sacrificing. Um, and I think that um, we need to move away from this idea that suffering is just intrinsically bad and we need to um, go back to traditions that um, accept suffering as a fact and try to make it intelligible and part of a human, you know, a flourishing human life. And so I, you know, I, I don't think that I'm not an Epicurean by a long shot, uh, but I think Epicurus is miles away from what contemporary hedonism was about because contemporary hedonists just sort of think um, not that you should have this kind of, um, contemplative lack of pain that Epicurus is on about, but that you should, that, but that your life is a series of states and a good life is one where you can look back and just say that you have a lot of pleasurable memories, right? It's, a, it's, a, it's like a pile or a heap 
of pleasurable states and there's no real unity to any of it. Um, and that sort of thing wouldn't be, wouldn't be attractive to Epicurus at all, who also has a very contemplative vision of the good life, right? We should, I mean, the reason he ends up saying that this kind of um, whatever, almost Zen-like state is the goal is because it's the most godlike. And that's, you know, you should try to live the most godlike life. That's not contemporary hedonism. It's nothing like Bentham or any of his heirs. Well, thank you very much, Jennifer Frey. And thank you, Mike Austin, for being here tonight at EKU Chautauqua. And thank you to everybody out there, uh, very actively chatting and asking questions, uh, even still. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, Jennifer, you no, know, I encourage you to, uh, when you have time, to take a look at the YouTube feed and the chat. There's all kinds of discussion there that I think you'll find fascinating. People responding in real time to what you're you're saying more than you know. Mike and I have been able to uh, uh, to uh, share. Um, any last thoughts, Mike, before I wrap things up here? No, just. Thank you very much. I thought it was the talk itself was very rich and uh, thought provoking. So like in the best philosophical way and the both the chat and then the interaction after was good. So yeah, this was a great, in some ways philosophy at its best, I think. So thank you. Agreed. Yeah, no, thanks, it was super fun. Yeah. It's been our pleasure. And I'm sure that um, this lecture's namesake, Ron Messerich, there's a picture of him right there. I'm sure he, uh, <laughs> Uh, seconds what we just said. And this is meant to remind everybody that uh, you can catch Ron himself at the next philosophy round table. I think it's April 14th. So next week I posted a link in the chat and or you can find it on the EKU philosophy and religious studies webpage. So uh, once again, thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Mike. Thank you to everybody out there. And since this this is the finale. Uh, thank you to everybody uh, who's made this virtual, uh, you know, uh, virtually adapted year of EKU Chautauqua a resounding success in spite of uh, some initial fears and challenges and what have you. And uh, we look forward to seeing everybody probably, hopefully, back on campus in the fall. Although there uh, is a chance that we may try to keep some aspect of this streaming platform and uh, the kind of mode of interaction that it enables as well and bring this into the regular mix of EKU Chautauqua. In any case, um, that's it for now. Everybody have a good night. Thank you, Tom, Carl, Matt, Chloe, everybody who's uh, saying good night. And uh, everybody stay well, be well, take care of yourselves, take care of each other and commit to the common good. <laughs> Okay, good night, everybody. Thank you very much.